the sun is not 93 million miles away. Well, that's easy to say, but can you prove it? Shut up and sit down, you big bald f***. Please subscribe. Apparently, everything we thought we knew about the sun's distance is a lie. And astronomers, they're just too daft to note this. But flat earther Kyle Adams, on the other hand, well, he has all the answers. So, uh... Let's see where they are, shall we? Why do people think the sun is 93 million miles away? People think that the sun is 93 million miles away because the distance has been determined and refined over centuries through a combination of astronomical observations, geometry, and increasingly sophisticated scientific methods. And it's also known as one astronomical unit, or an AU, which is now precisely defined as 149 billion 500 97 million 870 thousand seven hundred meters so uh we know because we've measured it so the real question should be why do you think it's not and can you prove it from two different places on earth we take measurements of the angles at which we see venus when it crosses in front of the sun we then take the distance between the two places on Earth and the angles we measured to form a triangle between the Earth and Venus. And then on those lines, we form another triangle between Venus and the Sun. Now, using our trigonomical skills, we can determine the distance to the Sun. The math is perfect. You can't argue with that. Oh, right, okay. Sounds like somebody actually read the textbook description of how it's done. Impressive. The maths is perfect. You're absolutely right. Which makes me wonder why exactly we're having this conversation. Unless, of course, there's some tiny insignificant detail you believe modern science completely overlooked. Like, say, the medium light travels through, maybe. So how are they wrong? Well, they're not, but I'm sure that whatever you're about to say will be very entertaining. Completely stupid, but entertaining nevertheless. The math is only as accurate as the measurements that were taken. The question is whether or not sunlight travels through a medium of constant density from its origin to its point of observation. Let's be absolutely clear here. Kyle doesn't have a clue what he's talking about. You don't say. And his big gotcha moment is that he seems to believe that the vacuum of space isn't a vacuum and that solar wind is so dense and uniform over 93 million miles that it fundamentally distorts our perception of distance. So science never thought to factor in things like atmospheric distortion then, did they, Kyle? You see, when light travels through matter, that varies in density, it bends. And those trigonomical triangles only work when light travels in straight lines. Right, because who needs consistent physics when you can just declare that the vast, vast emptiness of space is actually a funhouse mirror for photons? And conveniently, astronomers, with all their fancy equipment designed to measure things accurately, well, they somehow missed this pretty significant detail. Now, this is one of the things that bothers me the most about flat earthers. The fact that some of them, like Kyle Yeh, are arrogant enough to claim that all of physics is wrong and that they are right. Really? Yeah, well, light travels through space. What medium does it travel through in space? Light? unlike sound or water waves, doesn't actually need a medium to travel. I'm surprised you don't know that, Kyle, considering you're trying to tell people that an entire discipline in science has got all this stuff so terribly wrong. When sunlight travels through space, it's primarily traveling through a vacuum. Yes, there's solar winds, which is a stream of charged particles, but it's incredibly diffuse, far, far less dense than our own atmosphere. So it's not a medium of constant density in the way you're implying, Kyle, and its effect on light over astronomical distances, while measurable by very sensitive instruments, is absolutely accounted for. According to the World Space Agencies, the sun is constantly spewing out this stuff that they call solar wind. 
in all directions in varying magnitudes and densities. This solar wind mostly consists of plasma and energetic particles of carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, neon, and magnesium, all of which substances are known to have the capability to refract light when it passes through them. Okay, so he's quoting space agencies now, which is a new level of self-contradiction for the flat Earth crowd, but I'll allow it. Yeah, the sun does constantly spew out solar wind. That's a genuine scientific fact. And yes, it consists of plasma and various elements like carbon, nitrogen, and oxygen. But here's where the thinking stops and the making stuff up begins. What Kyle conveniently forgets to mention is the scale we're talking about. Imagine it like this. Take a handful, a single handful of dust, and then spread that single handful of dust out evenly across an entire continent. That would be closer to the density of solar winds in space. But solar wind is really thin. It can't refract light when it's so thin. Well, let's think about that for a second. Yeah, that's not bad advice, actually, coming from a flat earther, and it's a shame you can't take your own advice. Because if you had taken your own advice and thought before you spoke, then this video probably wouldn't exist. According to the World Space Agencies, the whole reason comets have tails is because of the amount of friction created when these comets travel through this solar wind. So solar winds are like a cosmic sandpaper then. You really need to stop just making stuff up when you don't actually understand the concept, pal. Now comets do interact with solar winds, absolutely, but it's not primarily friction in the way that Kyle is imagining it. As the comet gets closer to the sun, the ice on its surface turns directly into gas and it sublimates. The gas carries dust particles with it, forming the dust tail. The solar wind, which is a stream of charged particles, ionizes some of the gas escaping from the comet. And once these gas molecules become ionized, they are strongly influenced by the sun's magnetic field, which is carried by the solar wind. And this interaction sweeps these ions directly away from the sun, forming a separate, often bluish, kind of straight ion tail. And this tail always points directly away from the sun, regardless of the comet's direction of travel. So, are you telling me that solar wind is thick enough to give a comet a tail, but thin enough not to be able to refract light? Yeah, that's exactly what I'm telling you. Because you seem to think that by saying stuff like solar wind is simultaneously thick enough to give comets tails, but too thin to refract light, is some sort of aha moment. But... It completely collapses when you understand basic physics. Comet tails come from the solar wind's incredibly diffuse particles, pushing and ionizing the comet's own escaping gases, a process of kinetic energy and electromagnetic forces. But light refraction, which requires a far denser medium than the near vacuum of space, simply isn't significantly affected by the extremely sparse solar winds. Remember the handful of dust and an entire continent and analogy? Yeah, I think it's kind of funny. Though most astronomers thoroughly believe in solar wind, you won't read anywhere that they take any account for it when it comes to calculating the distance to the sun. Oh yeah, it's absolutely hilarious, Kyle. <laughs> <laughs> Because clearly, thousands of highly educated professionals who dedicate their entire lives to precision measurements and understanding the cosmos just collectively decided to forget about a fundamental phenomenon in their own backyard. It's the biggest scientific oversight since, since somebody thought the Earth was flat. And use the inconvenient truth for your second gotcha moment. Astronomers absolutely do understand solar wind. They study it extensively, but the reason you won't read anywhere that they account it for simple distance calculations for the sun is because for those calculations, its effect on light refraction is astronomically insignificant. Yeah, pun intended. The statement that the sun is on average about 93 million miles away 
is founded upon calculations, which are founded upon the idea that sunlight travels in straight lines through space. And of course, here we are, full circle. We're back to the foundational problem that he seems to think he's uncovered. The idea that sunlight travels in straight lines through space. Woo, yeah. Yeah, the 93 million mile figure and indeed most of our understanding of cosmic distances is founded on the principle that light travels in straight lines in a vacuum. The crucial part though is that interplanetary space is for all intents and purposes in this context a vacuum. Swiss so doing what it's meant to be doing. Your entire argument hinges on solar winds being a significant light bending medium. But it's not. Solar wind is, as I've already said, is so diffuse, it's so much less dense than any medium that would cause noticeable refraction over these distances that its effect is negligible. It's not a conspiracy, pal. It's just basic physics. Do a bit of reading. The straight line assumption is not a flaw. It's an accurate description of how light behaves in that environment. Trying to argue otherwise is like saying a single mosquito in a football stadium is going to throw off the trajectory of a rock it launch. Take out the foundation, the rest will fall. Well, yeah. <laughs> what? Now, one last thing that I would like you to keep in mind is even if solar wind were incredibly thin, the more distance you look through something incredibly thin, the thicker it will appear. And that can and does affect the way we perceive the light that travels through it. That would most definitely be the case over a distance of 93 million miles. And is that your last gasp of desperation? Because, you know, even if something is functionally non-existent, if you add enough other non-existent things to it, suddenly it becomes existent. Is, is that what you were going for? But yeah, in some scenarios, incredibly tiny effects can indeed accumulate over vast distances. That's a real principle in physics. But the operative word here is incredibly thin, or more accurately, incredibly diffuse. I like, I like that, that, that word, diffuse. Dif I, it's my new favourite. I think I've said it so much in this video, it's starting to sound weird. And now that I'm talking about my new favourite word of diffuse, I'm wondering whether I should have been pronouncing it diffuse. But I... No, I don't know. And the solar wind isn't just thin, it's so extraordinarily sparse that the interaction probability with photons over these distances is still practically zero in terms of causing a measurable systematic bending that would throw off the calculations of 93 million miles. The effect they're imagining just doesn't happen to the degree required to invalidate basic trigonometry. Thanks for watching, everybody. Love you. Bye. Out of everything that's on the internet, this is the best thing. You'll never guess what. Somebody's selling two canaries on eBay. Only trouble is they're not going cheap. <laughs> I don't think so. No, 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 no. I don't think so. No, 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 no. It's never, ever, ever, ever.